The peace of the Lord be with you, and good day. This is our devotion for uh, Monday, July 5th, and I hope you all had a, um, a happy 4th of July, and, and if you're you know, celebrating today as well, I hope you're having a good day, a good celebration uh, today. Um, our, our devotion, our gospel lesson, excuse me, this week is from Matthew chapter 5. It's, uh, I think it's a great passage for kind of helping us to understand the relationship between the Old and New Testament. Uh, it's in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, and um, I'll be getting this out in this, the early evening. So we'll, we'll follow the early evening order, page 297 in the hymnal, and begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice, joyous light of glory, of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. All right. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said of old to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. Be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Let us pray. Blessed Lord Jesus Christ, it's in you that we find the fulfillment of the law. We thank you that um, as, uh, as this word of God is spoken by God himself, that we know that it stands forever, that uh, that heaven and earth will pass away, but but the word of the Lord will never pass away. And as we hear that word from you, we pray that, um, that you would grant us that uh, assurance and that knowledge that that word will not pass away, but also the even greater comfort that, um, that you are the fulfillment of that law, that as we hear of the, um, as we, we hear of the, the, the punishment that we deserve for, for breaking that law, that you have uh, that you have stood in our place underneath that punishment on the cross, and that in that then we would know that um, that all things have been forgiven, that uh, that the, the law has not been diminished, but your fulfillment of it has brought us life and salvation as you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, so as I said, this passage uh, gives us insight into the relationship between the Old and the New Testament, right? Uh, as, as you hear the Old Testament, uh, you know, that's what he says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets, you know, and, and I think this is important for us to hear because we, you know, whether we mean to or not, have a tendency to, to just sort of sweep the Old Testament under the rug, and, and we don't necessarily understand why. For example, um, you know, one of the arguments that's often made against Christians is, well, you can't believe the whole Bible, because if you did believe the whole Bible, then you would, you would not eat shellfish, you wouldn't eat pork, you wouldn't eat sausage, that kind of thing, right? Well, that's not, uh, and the reason they say that is if you look at the, the Old Testament kosher law, that's true. There was a, 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 a forbidding of eating shellfish, there was a forbidding of eating pork, right? If you wanted to keep kosher, you couldn't do those things. So, so why do we as Christians eat those things then? Well, because Jesus has fulfilled the law for us. And, and he explicitly says, well, it's not what goes into a man by his mouth that makes him unclean, but what comes out of him. And, and Paul, or excuse me, uh, the Lord gives Peter that the vision in, in Acts uh, chapter 9, if I recall correctly, where um, it's 9 or 10, where, where there's this vision of, uh, of him speaking to Peter and saying, behold, all foods are clean. Right? The, so, so Jesus 
didn't, it's not as though, so we say, well, we don't have to do that because that's the Old Testament. It's, it's that we say, okay, that's fulfilled. And, and so as we understand then our life in Christ, what, 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 do we, what do we keep and what do we not keep, right? Well, we understand that the law is not cast away. In particular, what we understand is that um, as Jesus fulfills the whole law for us, that there's an aspect of that law which, um, which we see to, be, uh, to, to understand to be God's will in a, in a, in a particular way. And what we'll read as we read the, 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 the readings this week, we'll see that that's the Ten Commandments, right? Um, I'll, I'll make this point then too, but the Ten Commandments have a unique place amongst the Old Testament law. Those are the only words that God himself spoke to the Israelites. Now, Jesus fulfilled the Ten Commandments for us, uh, and, and as we'll look at this passage, we'll see he fulfilled the, the whole law for us, and that's good, because if he didn't, we would be out of luck. Right there's there's um, th- th- there's a demand of the law that we'll we'll talk about here in a minute that would would we w- we would be in trouble right so so understanding that w- w- that um, and, uh, you know I, I think the way to put this is we have a, a hard time understanding what does it mean that we are saved by grace through faith with with regard to the law right uh, you know and so so this gives us a, a, an insight into that it's that Jesus did not come to to cast away the law so that we ignore it. But he came to fulfill it for us. So, so let's look at what that means here. Uh, okay, so, so what does this mean? For Verse 18, For truly I say to you, uh, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. An iota is a Greek, Greek letter. You know, uh, Sometimes this is translated jot and tittle. Not, not the least mark of the law will, will, be, will pass away until all is accomplished. Um, and, and, and you can understand that um, that's kind of, Maybe ambiguous. You know, the end of time comes to us in the, the the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross is the end of the age, right? Of the the, the age of sin. So so that is accomplishing really all things. Um, but at the same time, then that that's finally accomplished. It it is coming on, in the last days. So um, how do we understand that? Well, we understand it ultimately that Christ fulfills the law for us, and. This still applies, though. Whoever relaxes, then, one of the least of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we should still abide by God's commands. As we live in this creation, we should still abide by God's commands. And that's one of the things that we see as the, the Ten Commandments have their unique place is that, um, is that they, are, they are what we could call natural law. They are The, the way Luther saw it is that, is that they are... An epitomizing of the law written into this creation. They are they are a law epitomizing that call. You know, elsewhere Jesus says, "Well, the greatest commandment is to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself." They are kind of an explanation of that. This is all you know, hand in hand with this creation. We see how when you do those things, things in this creation function better. Like our society functions better when we keep that law. When we love our neighbor as that law tells us to, things work better, right? So that's this this natural aspect. But when it comes to heaven, I tell you, verse 20, I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, you have to hear this with the ears that the people at that time heard it with, and, and that's that the, the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, they're, they're the pastors, right? They're the... Um, or maybe not the pastors, but the, the really, really pious lay people. At least that's how they're perceived. Uh, the problem was, you know, they thought that they were that they were pretty righteous, right? They thought that they were they were that they were those righteous people, and they and they they let you know it. And of course, you know, we all we all have experiences with people like that who think that they, you know, that we with self righteousness, and we all have to be guarded against self righteousness ourselves, right? It's very easy for us to become self righteous. But so that you know, they, to to the point though, they they looked at these examples and said, "I got to be more righteous than those guys." Oh no, that's the point though. The law comes when you don't relax any any commandment. When you don't relax any of it, as you hear Jesus is going to say, then that that law comes and it tells you exactly where you stand before God, that you stand before Him, and that's what Jesus draws out here. The uh, one of the notes that I have has a. As a quote from what's called the Formula of Concord, that's one of the, the writings of the early Lutherans, and um, they they were explaining this. They said Jesus explains the law spiritually here. 
you know, the spiritual understanding of the law isn't the, the external, literal understanding of the law. This is, this is the, full, the full meaning of it, the full spiritual meaning of it. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And of course, the, Jesus isn't, um, isn't ignoring the commandment here. He's not saying, well, you know, the commandment said this, and I'm saying something else. This is um, more, it seems to be more a commentary on, like, rabbinical commentaries, on, on the law, so so uh, you know the, the commandment said you should not murder. Well, the, then the rabbi said whoever murders will be liable to judgment, and and that that's to be understood judgment to to like the council, the Sanhedrin, or or the ruling council, whatever that is. So Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire, right? And that's that's the um, the thing here is that. You know, even even if you you call someone a fool, you're a murderer. And we look at the you know that's that's one of the things I often say. Make that point. We we look at the at the law and we say, well, you, you know, yeah, it's not like I've actually killed somebody. I'm I'm not that bad of a person. Yeah, you called them a fool. You're a murderer, right? You deserve God's wrath against murder. You deserve hell. And that's the point that Jesus makes in you know, the spiritual interpretation of the law is that making the point none of us deserves heaven. All of us will deserve the wrath of God. None of us will enter the kingdom of heaven by that righteousness, right? Um, so that's really what, what he's drawing out here. And he says, you know, going on, so if you are offering your gift at the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. You know, don't don't think that you are so righteous that, that you your, um, your brother doesn't deserve your forgiveness, right? Uh, if your brother did something against you, you better forgive him, because God forgives you, right? You look at how look at how you've murdered, even, because uh, you've all been angry at somebody. Look at how you've murdered, yet God has forgiven you. So come to terms quickly with your accuser. Verse 25, while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser you hand, hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison, because you deserve it. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Right? And that's the, um, that's the full brunt of the law. You won't get out of hell until you've laid, paid the last penny. And in hell, you know, the, the, the cost is infinite. So there is no paying the last penny. Right? That's what the that's what the burden of the law is. And that's what Christ bore upon himself on the cross. And so that's what the connection is. You know what so so how are we saved by grace through faith and and what's the connection between that and good, doing good works? Well, we do good works not because they get us to heaven. That's the easy answer, right? We do good works not because they get us to heaven, uh, but because because of the new life in Christ. And we're going to talk we're going to talk more about that new life in Christ tomorrow because we're going to be talking about baptism, Romans chapter six. So uh, rather than than continuing on, I'm going to give you a little bit of a cliffhanger, and we'll pick up there uh, pick up there for tomorrow's devotion. All right. So we continue with the uh, with the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, stay with us for the evenings at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and waken us. Hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.